Not a beast! Ah! I will have my eyes! My eyes! This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. So by now, it is no secret that I have a weird fascination with the dystopian young adult novels that got really, really popular in the early 2010s. I, and I can't say exactly why. There's just something about the way that they all worked within such really rigid confines, but they also tried desperately to be original, even though they really didn't need to work within rigid confines, and they didn't really need to be original, but they, they tried, and so it just wound up making them go in absolutely insane directions, like Hunger, which is a book about a world where food is illegal, and I'll, I will probably read that series one day just because it's so bonkers and out there. Or Breathe, a book series which I already covered last year, which is about people having to pay for air and the government destroying all of the trees. Which brings us to Stung, which is today's topic. That's a book series about bees turning people into zombies. <laughs> well, okay, not exactly. It's a little different than that. But, sort of. It's sort of about them turning people into zombies. The series is only two books long. It's Stung and then Cured. And the first book actually begins with the protagonist, her name is Fiona, waking up in her house. And her house is all destroyed for some reason. She has no memory of what's been happening lately. She looks a lot older than she remembers being, and she has a mysterious tattoo on the back of her hand. And then she's attacked by a crazy man, she flees, and the story begins from there. Uh, apparently this is supposed to be a reimagining of Sleeping Beauty? Uh, like a bee sting instead of a needle makes her go into an eternal sleep and then she wakes up from it, but that's kind of a stretch because, especially as we learn later, it wasn't really a bee sting that made her go into an eternal sl slumber, but okay, whatever. That said, the opening to the story is actually pretty solid. You know, it's unclear what's going on. All we know is that there was an apocalypse of some sort, and wondering what happened and how Fiona wound up in this spot is actually kind of a fascinating question. The details of the setting and the backstory here are a mystery, and they're a mystery that kept me invested. You know, I kept coming back wanting to know more, but the thing is, every time we learn more, every time we get the answer to a question, it's, um it becomes clearer just how freaking dumb these books are, because they are. They are very, very, very stupid. However, the good news is that the books are dumb, but they're not boring. They're bad, but they're funny bad. They're also not very long. Again, it's only two books, and they're not very long, and apparently the series is incomplete. We'll get to that later, but, you know, it's, it's not that long. And while the books have shortcomings, and while they are weird at times, if you're into bad books, I would recommend checking them out, and I don't know, I will also say that the books do two things very, very well. The first one I already mentioned is the opening. Like I said, it's very, very good. The second thing they do well is actually the prose, like the way it's written. Sometimes it's great. Sometimes it's weird and stupid, but a lot of times it's genuinely great. Like, Bethany Wiggins is the author of these books, and j just to be clear, you should not confuse Bethany Wiggins with Wendy Higgins. Like, Wendy Higgins wrote a different series of books called Sweet Evil, which I haven't read, but I thought they were the same person for a while. No, that Stung is somebody different. But Bethany Wiggins has several bad lines, but she also has a bunch of scenes that paint these really, really vivid pictures that I was just getting into, you know? Like, you can really get into the POV character's head and see their thought process as they take in what's going around them, what's going on around them whether it's something beautiful or something scary. And it's very good, it's only sometimes very good, but you know, it's, it's very good sometimes. Anyways, um, I guess now it's time to get to like the roast or whatever the hell it is that this next part is. So we're going into the summary of the series and that's gonna be spoilers, so just be aware. I just can't think of anything good about a skull. What about pure Aryan skull shape? <laughs> Even that is more usually depicted with the skin still on. So as I said, we start with Fiona awakening. She's in her house, but it's all wrecked, and it looks like it hasn't been lived in for a long, long time. While looking around, she actually looks at herself in the mirror, and she's a lot older than she remembers looking. Like, she describes herself as being a woman, but she remembers being a girl. And we later learn that she was unconscious for four years. Like, she went under when she was 13, so now she's 17. So she did a lot of growing while in her coma? 
I don't know if that's the word for it. She also has a tattoo on her hand that she doesn't remember getting. And a crazed man with a matching tattoo to hers attacks her and she runs off. And when she leaves home, she realizes that the whole city seems abandoned. And these books take place primarily in and around the city of Denver, Colorado. Look, I have joked before that every single dystopian young adult series had to visit Denver at some point, but that's becoming less and less of a joke with every series I read. I swear to God, it, it is seriously like there's an actual checklist they need to follow, and it says they need to be in Denver at some point, and I don't know why. While wandering around, Fiona sees flyers warning people about the bee flu, and talking about quarantines and staying away from infected people because they act crazed and can be violent. And Fiona barely remembers anything, though, because her mind is really fuzzy after waking up. Like, over time, a lot of this comes back to her and her memory gets jogged, but for now, at the beginning, she, her mind is just really, really fuzzy. We also learn around this point that the leader of Colorado is the only authority left, since the federal government collapsed and the other states are all either non-existent or unable to really communicate with Denver. And the leader of Colorado is named Governor Jacoby Sonishin. Governor Jacoby Sonishin. That's a name so amazing, I need to say the whole thing every time I bring him up. Now, Fiona walks past a house which is actually inhabited, and she runs into a girl that she used to go to school with and her family. And the girl she used to go to school with, her name is Jackie, which is short for Jacqueline but it's spelled like this instead of the normal way. Please take a moment to look at your screen and observe this abomination. That is how Jackie spells her name. Where's Jay Quellen at? No Jay Quellen here? Now, Jackie wants to help her out, but her family won't when they see the tattoo, and so Jackie just gives Fiona some directions and tells her good luck. Now, this is the only part that Jackie is in in this book, but she becomes relevant in book two, which is why I'm mentioning her here. We know that there's a nearby militia that kills anyone that has Fiona's tattoo on sight, and as we later learn, there's also people who have the bee flu, sort of, and went crazy. They're just called beasts. And we also learn that there are raiders. And yes, the not-zombies in this story are just straight-up called beasts, and they all share a mark on their hand. I know writers who use subtext, and they're all cowards. Now, most living people live in a big walled-off area of Denver, which is just called the Walled City. We don't know much about it, it's just the Walled City, it's run by Governor Jacoby Sonishin. Now, while wandering around a little longer, Fiona runs into a young boy named Aaron, and he takes her into the sewers to avoid some men with guns who are nearby. Except, oh wait, Aaron is actually a girl named Eris, but she's pretending to be a boy. And apparently it's safer to be a boy because raiders go after women and girls to make them sex slaves, which, unfortunately, yeah, that, that does seem like an actual risk. So Fiona also starts dressing up as a boy for safety. But after a while, she gets captured by some militia anyways, and they decide they want to sell her off to a lab in exchange for honey. Because their main currency in this world is honey. <laughs> I'll, I'll get more on that later, but just keep in mind throughout this whole book, whenever characters are bartering or offering things or trying to bribe people, they do it with honey. Like, at first I thought honey might have just been a weird nickname for cash, but no, it's just, it's just literal honey. Like the stuff you get in jars that honeybees make. <laughs> but anyways, the guy who's in charge of the militia that captured her is an old neighbor whose name is Bowen. And she actually used to have a crush on his older brother, which doesn't matter that much to the story, even though I thought it would at first, but it, it doesn't matter, but it, you know, it did happen. And Fiona has a few random flashbacks to before she went unconscious, and that does fill in some of the blanks about how the world wound up like this. You know, like, like I said earlier, the mysteries about how the world actually wound up this way are kind of intriguing at first, and it's revealed to us slowly over time. But basically, the government wanted to deal with all the honeybees dying, which is a problem in real world, actually. And so their solution to the problem was to create a new species that was hardier. But the super honeybees, they, they just went nuts and killed all of the other bees. And then they started stinging people, too. And their venom gives flu-like symptoms. And also, it's contagious somehow. 
like, yeah, you get stung by a honeybee and it gives flu-like symptoms and then you can also give that to other people and it's deadly a lot of the time. That's a, that's a thing that happens. And I know what you're thinking. The stings made people into zombies. And that's not what happened. There's, there's no easy way to put this, but the bee stings did not create the zombies. The vaccine for the bee stings created the zombies. Not actually sure how you make a vaccine for a bee sting, but that's, that's what happened. Fiona and her twin brother, whose name is Jonah, uh, got them before most people because their dad was high-ranking military. And after a while, it turned them into beasts. And people who got more doses of the vaccine turned into more dangerous beasts. They're, they're referred to as levels, like by the number of doses they got is what level they are. So if they got three doses, they're level three. Fiona and her brother are both level 10s, which is the maximum level. And all the people who did not get the vaccine wound up being okay. And so anyways, the government used a powerful pesticide to wipe out the super bees, but it also killed most other plants and animals. Like w when they're walking around, Fiona notices that all the plants she sees all over the place are just dead. Wait a minute. Dead vegetation, crumbling ruins, armed gangs everywhere. It's filled with anti-vaxxers. Oh, God damn it. Denver has just turned into Pueblo. I don't care if nobody understands that joke. I'm, I'm leaving it in. <laughs> Fuck Pueblo, that place sucks. Anyways, Bowen and Fiona get along. He recognizes her from before, so he knows that she's a girl, but he doesn't tell the others because he doesn't know how they'll react. And he actually calls her Foe as a nickname, like F-O. Not really great as a shortened form of Fiona. Wouldn't Fee be better? Whatever. Uh, and anyways, the other kids, when she was young and they wanted to be mean, other kids would call her Fotard. And sometimes Bowen does that too, and, but it's like endearing or something. <laughs> it's not the only way this book aged poorly. <laughs> But honestly, overall, Bowen does seem like a good dude. He explains to her that she can try running away, but she'll probably get caught by raiders. And Fiona responds with, and I quote, What are raiders? Because she's fucking stupid. <laughs> raiders? That, that's not a made-up term. That There's a football team called the Raiders. <laughs> This girl's so stupid, I swear. Anyways, um, like I said, she has 10 marks on her tattoo, meaning she got 10 doses of the vaccine, meaning uh, more doses means more powerful beasts. So the other soldiers are like nervous around her and scared of her and wondering what'll happen if she goes nuts. So some of the soldiers decide she's too, too dangerous and they try to kill her. And she fights back against them, accidentally kills one of them, and then the others investigate when they hear noise and see what's going on and they realize that she's a girl. And after this, Bowen takes her and runs because he thinks his fellow militiamen are going to assault her or try selling her to raiders or something. From here, the story gets really disjointed. Like, basically, they just run around looking for safety for a while. That's all you need to know. Eventually, Fiona is captured, or I, I guess sold would be a better word, by Aaron slash Eris, the girl from before. And she thinks she's going to get brought to a lab, but she's not. She's brought to a fighting pit to fight other beasts to the death in front of a crowd. And Aaron is also in prison there and is also gonna be thrown into the pits along with Fiona and some beasts. And uh, apparently Fiona is the first person to wake up from the coma and to cure others, to create a cure from her, scientists have to kill her. Sure, that doesn't make a lot of sense, but sure. And also, Governor Jacoby Sonishin is here, and he wants her eliminated for some reason. Like, he seems to be in charge of this pit, because he's bossing the people running the arena around. And anyways, Fiona gets thrown into the pit, along with Aaron and some beasts, and she's advertised as a level 10 beast, and they say, Oh, we actually have another level 10 beast. We got two of them. And when they open the gates, she sees, like, oh, that's her twin brother, Jonah. Also around this point, we learned that Aaron slash Eris was actually a boy the whole time. So he was a boy pretending to be a girl, pretending to be a boy. I don't know why he did this, but that's a, that, that's a thing he did. Anyways, there's a big fight and Fiona barely manages to fend off some of the beasts for a little while. It's actually kind of a cool scene, to be honest with you. Like, we can really feel the desperation of the moment and Fiona isn't super well trained or experienced, but she's determined to survive and she uses what she has and she just thinks like, hit them in their weak points, don't let up, run away when you need to. Like it's, 
It's actually not a terrible scene. And then Bowen shows back up and saves her, and he stops the fight, and he announces that he loves Fiona. Just to be clear, it has been about three days since she woke up from her coma, and it's been even less time since she has run into Bowen, but sure, sure, whatever. And there, there's some more violence following this, and Bowen gets hurt. But luckily, the vaccine gives her super healing powers, and since she still has traces of it in her system, not how that works, she just has to kiss Bowen and he'll heal. And the guy who tells her this is a scientist, so he couldn't possibly be wrong. We also get the line, quote, I kiss him like I'm the blood transfusion he needs. What the hell did you just say? So Bowen survives, he, he heals up a little bit, and then they all go back to a lab with the scientist from before, and he explains everything. Basically, the cure was invented a while ago, but Governor Jacoby Sonishin is killing everyone who gets the cure because he doesn't want one to be there. Like, yeah, they, they were giving the cure to people, and then they were healing, but then they were dying not long afterwards, and after a while they realized Governor Jacoby Sonishin was having them eliminated because he doesn't want a cure because... If the cure isn't there, then the beasts will no longer be a threat and he'll lose his power. You would think he would want the cure to be around, but he would control it. You know, he would control who gets it and who doesn't. That would actually solidify his power. But okay, I guess he's just a dumbass. So the scientist gave Fiona the cure and sent her out into the ruins to recover so that she wouldn't get targeted by Governor Jacoby Sonishin. It's crazy dangerous and stupid, but... I guess it worked. Anyways, we also learned that Governor Jacoby Sonishin and his inner circle have been drinking beast blood, which apparently makes them super strong and gives them healing power. I, you would think it would just infect them, but sure, okay. Uh, they also cure Fiona's brother, Jonah, and the two of them have an older sister who is married to the scientist, but she does nothing in this series, and then that's, like, that's how book one ends. It's like... Again, it's more funny bad than anything, but it is still a weird spot to end it. And if you're thinking like, okay, the story will continue in a way that makes sense, then you thought wrong. Because then we go to book two, Cured, and that is from Jackie's perspective. Remember the girl from before who Fiona went to school with and then ran into very briefly at the beginning of book one? Yeah, she's, the, the whole book is from her perspective now. Yeah, Stung does that thing that a lot of romance series do where every book focuses on a new couple and it never works because that just means that all the character development and the story itself has to be reset, essentially. Or maybe it's more accurate to say the character development has to be reset because we have to watch every character go through their own arc in their own book as opposed to it all happening organically at once. And the story also has to be put on hold so that we can watch every character go through their arc, but... Whatever. It does that. So anyways, Jackie lives at the house where Fiona ran into in her in book one, along with her parents and her older brothers. Her dad is a dentist, actually, and he gives treatment to anyone who's willing to pay, whether they are, like, civilized people from within the walled city or raiders or whoever else. And that, like, her dad is useful, people want him around, and that combined with their high security means raiders largely leave them alone. However, when... Whenever anyone comes to their house or near their house, Jackie pretends to be a 12-year-old boy named Jack. Again, they could still... Uh, Jackie could be a boy's name. I'm not... It, like, that, that doesn't really strike me as particularly feminine. Also, Jackie is 17, so I'm not really sure how well that would work. Like, sure, if a teenage girl was pretending to be a teenage boy, maybe make her go by you know, two or three years younger than you really are, but a 17-year-old girl does not look like a 12-year-old boy, okay? A 17-year-old girl might look like a 14 or 15-year-old boy if you, you know, you cut her hair and had her wear clothes that covered her boobs and stuff, but, like, still, that that's weird, okay? <laughs> she wouldn't look that young. Anyways, Jackie's brother named Dean has gone missing, and she decides she's gonna go out looking for him, and she's doing it with Fiona and Bowen and Jonah because we need to tie this into the first book somehow. Now, the others have the cure and are planning on taking it to a rumored safe settlement in Wyoming. I think for mass production? I, I Again, I'm not totally sure why they're going to this uh, rumored settlement, which they don't even know for sure exists, because it's a dangerous journey and... Like, again, they have the cure already. Why are they doing this? I seriously, I don't know. I'm not even sure if Governor Jacoby Sonishin is still in charge of Denver or not. 
Like, I think he's not anymore. I think people found out about the cure and then overthrew him, but I just, I seriously, I don't know. I don't know. But what, that's not important because what is important is the love story of this tertiary character from book one that none of the main cast cared about before now. Anyways, Jackie's parents wouldn't let her leave, so she drugs them and then runs off in the middle of the night to meet up with the others. And apparently they do have some guard dogs around, but only Jackie and her family can command them. Quote, Our dogs speak Italian. That way no one can give them orders unless they speak Italian. Uh, sorry, I don't speak Italian. I, I guess that makes sense. I, I don't know. I'm not an expert, but sure. Why not? So she meets up with the rest of them. They march north for a while, avoiding raiders, fighting raiders. Don't really have to deal with beasts. They just kind of deal with other people. And they run into a familiar young man who is about 19 years old. And Jackie calls him the Vagabond, but we later learn that his real name is Kevin. Now, years earlier, he came near their house and he was on the verge of starving. And Jackie, even though she was really hungry herself, gave him some applesauce and he was really grateful. And after a while of them all being together, avoiding raiders, Kevin teams up with them to help on their journey. So they continue avoiding raiders, they keep moving. Not much happens except Kevin figures out that Jackie is a girl and they start... I guess they start being into each other. Again, it it's the thing a lot of crappy romances do where it's like simultaneously really, really abrupt and comes out of nowhere, but also it just builds and builds and builds forever without going anywhere. It somehow manages to do both of those at once. Eventually, Kevin does drop the three special words. He tells Jackie that he loves her. And he says that he fell in love with her when she gave him the applesauce a couple years ago. You know... You know she was pretending to be a 12-year-old boy at the time, so he would have... Didn't he think she was a 12-year-old boy? Is he saying he fell in love with a 12-year-old boy? FBI, open up! Anyways, some raiders arrive and they get captured. It turns out Kevin was a raider all along! Oh no! But he tells Jackie that he will help them and she should stay calm. And she trusts him, because shut up. They go to the raider base, and Governor Jacoby Sonishin is there, obviously. And so is Dean, you know, Jackie's older brother, who she was looking for. Now, her and Dean don't say anything, but they do clearly recognize each other. And he does make sure that they don't hurt her too badly when she's caught, and helps make sure that they don't realize she's a girl either. So, like, he's clearly still on her side. He's doing something, so we don't even get a moment of, like, oh, betrayal, or anything like that. And anyways, they get brought to... Another fighting pit, not the same one from the first book, we're just doing the same thing, where the characters are brought to a fighting pit to fight beasts, and they have to survive somehow. It's just the, the same climax as book one. And the raiders are dumb enough that they don't actually search the main characters, so Jackie has a knife with her when she goes into the pits, even though they're supposed to be barehanded, and Jonah has several cure vials with them. And they aren't fighting regular beasts, they're fighting dogs who were fed beast blood. So they're super big and strong and heal fast, but other than that, they're, they're dogs. However, these aren't just like regular attack dogs, which you might be thinking. The raiders actually trained them to attack the walled city because they're going to assault the city, send out the dogs, and the dogs are going to kill all the men, and then the raiders can take the women for themselves because apparently they trained the beast dogs to only ever attack men and then just leave women alone? And I'll be honest with you, I don't know how that works, because when he releases them, they attack Jackie for a minute, but then they realize that she's a girl, and then they ignore her and only focus on attacking Jonah from that point forward. And, like, how, how did they tell? Like, do women smell differently in this world where people very rarely bathe? Or can the dogs just tell what somebody's gender is the same way that transvestigators can just tell what somebody's gender is? I... I don't know. So anyways, the raiders see that the dogs are leaving her alone and they all si simultaneously seem to realize, oh, that's a girl. And they're so crazed at the sight of a woman that they all jump in the pit and start fighting each other trying to get to her? Like, wh what? <laughs> this is such a strange moment. <laughs> Meanwhile, Jonah injects the dog beasts with the cure. And it's not an instant cure, but they will turn back to normal within a few days. And anyways, Governor Jacoby Sonishin and the rainer who trained the dogs fall into the pit and the dogs attack them. I'm not sure how he was able to train the dogs when they didn't... Like, if, how, wouldn't they learn to trust him? Wouldn't they learn to like him a little bit? 
or at least learn to obey him, I'm, I'm not sure. But you know what? During all of this, Jackie and the others manage to escape. And Kevin and Jackie are by themselves while running away, and they're confronted by J Governor Jacoby Sonishin, who is alive, but he was wounded pretty badly by the dogs. And after a bit of a standoff, she shoots him, and then they leave. And I think that Governor Jacoby Sonishin is supposed to be dead at this point, but it also could easily have been a fake out and he would have returned in book three. So anyways, they all meet back up and they go on to Wyoming along with Jackie's brother, Dean. He was pretending to be a raider because I, I think he was acting as a spy among the raiders. I, I'm honestly not sure, but he was only pretending to be a raider. And then they do reach the rumored safe settlement up in Wyoming and they see Jonah and Fiona's mom, as well as Dean's wife and new baby, who Jackie didn't know about. So she's like, oh cool, I have a little niece now, isn't that awesome? And it ends with them going and finding Kevin's sister, who is a beast, and she's held in a cage, and they're about to give her the cure. And that is it. That is the end. There, There is no book three. Oh, brother, this guy stinks! Yeah, there is no real ending to Stung, and I'm not sure why. Like, there's no real resolution to the world being destroyed. I think the villain is still out there somewhere. Fiona and Jackie and the rest of them seem to have found a safe place, but it seems kind of precarious. Like, it's a small settlement and it's hidden away from the world because they just, they know it's dangerous out there. And they also know that people like Governor Jacoby Sonishin might attack them, presumably. So, it, like, we just don't get a real ending. And apparently, the author did plan a trilogy. The last one was supposed to be from Jonah's POV, but the publisher didn't buy the whole series. They didn't buy the whole trilogy. And that's kind of weird, because normally publishers will buy a whole series in situations like this, rather than doing one at a time. Like, I'm not saying that the author is lying, but it does sound like she's leaving something out, because the Stung books, at least the first two of them, seem to have sold pretty well. And at the time they came out, the dystopian YA genre was huge. So I feel like there must have been something that made the publisher not want any more books. Like, I'm not accusing the author of anything, okay? Don't go accusing her of being difficult to work with or anything. Like, I'm just saying that there seems to be a missing puzzle piece here. And, like, Bethany Wiggins even claims that she could self-publish the ending. She just hasn't done it because she either, like, she just doesn't seem to want to, she doesn't seem to feel like it, even though she has published several other books. Like, since the second Stung book came out, she has written a couple others. Her last one came out in 2021. So, she's still writing, or at least she was three years ago, so I'm, I'm not sure what's going on here. This is such a strange mystery to me, and even more so because I really have nothing to go on. Like, there's, there's no evidence to try and gather and piece together. There's no rabbit holes to descend into. There's just a decision here that doesn't make much sense on the surface. Like, I just, I don't know. That, that's all. I don't have anything else to say. Just that, that's weird. So you may have figured out by now that insta-love is stupid. And it happens twice in this series. If the third book from Jonas POV ever came out, we would probably see it a third time. And that's dumb, and that's bad. It keeps us from really getting to know the couple. We don't get to see them fall in love. We don't get to see them go through difficult times. We don't get to see all that stuff that comes with being in love, you know? Like, ask yourself, which is more fun? A roller coaster, which has ups and downs and twists and turns, or a roller coaster where you just climb to the top of a big hill and then got off, got off. Because that's what insta-love is. Like, it's just, a little bit of build up, build up, and then just they're in love and everything's great. Like, th there's, there's nothing there. Stop doing insta-love, please. And stop doing insta-love pretending to be slow burn because it's really obvious. But even besides that, there's a lot of stuff making the romance weird. Like first we have Fiona and Bowen. Now Fiona, physically, she is 17, but mentally she's 13. <laughs> like remember, she was, unconscious as a beast for four freaking years. She missed out on a big part of growing up. She's basically still a kid. Now, I'm not saying that Bowen can't do anything with her, but maybe he should think about it a little bit. You know, maybe he should 
stop and realize that Fiona is more of a traumatized child in a young woman's body, and she should take a while to mature and adjust to her new life before starting a relationship. Might be a good idea for her to realize that too. Like, she's still new to this post-apocalyptic world. It's going to take time to get used to deprivation and violence, in addition to a lot of her loved ones either being dead or missing. And on top of that, I can't tell you what they love about each other. Like, Bowen helps her out for a little bit, and he doesn't sexually assault her, but what personality does he have besides being not evil? Very little. He has very little personality besides that. Like, there's a scene where he shows her how to use a paintbrush to pollinate flowers, and that's a nice little moment, but he and Fiona are just both too vacuous to make me feel anything at all for their love story. And I'll get a bit more into Fiona later, but they, there's just nothing to either of them. And then we have Kevin and Jackie. It's a similar story with them, it's just insta-love, but Jackie does have a little bit more personality. Like, she's insecure, she's supremely anxious, understandable given the circumstances, She's determined to find her brother at all cost, and her only real ability is being able to run far and fast, because before she goes out on this journey, she ran eight miles every day on a treadmill, just in case she ever needed to. And at the end, she overcomes some of her anxiety to take down Governor Jacoby Sonishin. She shoots him at the end. And it's not a lot, but it's it's something, you know, it's, it's something to go, to go off of. She has a little bit of personality. And then there's Kevin, who is just... He's not a rapist, and that's why she loves him. Well, okay, he's not a rapist, and before the apocalypse, he faked some paperwork to make sure his sister got the vaccine instead of him, because at that time he thought it would save her from the bee flu. So, there's that. I guess he's a stand-up guy now. But again, he fell in love with her thinking she was a 12-year-old boy. <laughs> like, I, or at least I think. Like, Kevin found out she was a girl on his own, but it's kind of unclear when he found out she was a girl, because at first when they run into each other in the present day, he is referring to her as a boy, and then at one point after they've been together for like a few hours or a day, he says, hey, I know you're a girl now. And I, did he just figure it out throughout that, or did he know the whole time? I'm honestly not sure. I'm hoping he knew the whole time. And on top of that, Jackie just latched onto the first dude she met after only being around her dad and her brothers and the occasional dental patient for years. Like, these aren't the most unhealthy relationships I've ever seen. That still goes to Everneath, but they're not fucking good. They're fucking terrible. Like, both in terms of quality and in terms of healthiness. Like, they're just, they're just bad. Foggy! All right, the science in this book is fucking stupid. Let's just go over it one item at a time. Number one, the bees are dying. Why would the government decide to make genetic super bees? Like, we, we've already done that in real life. We have killer African bees, and they cause a lot of problems. So we already know this sort of thing can end badly. And if the government created them, there's no way they would have missed that they have the ultra-deadly venom, which can give people flu-like symptoms. Like... They they wouldn't have missed that, and they wouldn't have released them if they could do that. Like, it would honestly just make a lot more sense for them to do something to breed more honeybees. Number two, if the honeybees did die out, that would be bad, but other animals and insects can pollinate plants. You know, not all plant life would suddenly die out. Like, honeybees aren't native to North America, actually. They came here during the Columbian Exchange. Before they came around, there were other ways of getting plants pollinated. Granted, a lot of the animals and insects that used to do that are extinct, or close to extinct, but give them some time, and maybe a little bit of help from humanity, and they could recover. And worst case scenario, people could pollinate plants ourselves. Like, there are ways of doing that. I actually read a short story about that exact thing when I was a kid. Like, the honeybees died out, and so people had to go out and pollinate stuff by hand, and it led to famine. Number three, the pesticide kills the super bees, but it also kills everything else. How? How? Like, I, different chemicals affect different animals and plants differently. Like, that's why some people are allergic to bee stings, but other people are not. Plus, the only, like, animal, the only wild animals they have to worry about and avoid are wolves. Like, wolves are still around somehow, even though the whole ecosystem should have collapsed. So clearly the wolves still have something to eat, they have some sort of food store source, meaning the pesticide didn't kill everything, 
but the characters keep saying it killed everything. Later, they see an area n near Wyoming that got uh, set on fire to, quote, burn away the toxin, and then the plants are flourishing there. So again, not everything died. This doesn't make sense. Number four, the vaccines turning people into super strong, insane beasts. Do I need to elaborate on that? Like, vaccines leave your system after a few days, your body creates antibodies to protect from inf infections. Like, this is just anti-vaxxer shit, but kind of in the opposite direction, because it says it gives you superpowers. Like, that's not how vaccines work, dude. They just make you create antibodies, that's all. Number five, they refer to the illness as the bee flu, but it's their venom. And uh, again, why is their venom so dangerous? They should have caught that in testing. I guess they're just idiots. And for, for that matter, bee stings aren't contagious. That, that's why if you get stung, it won't affect other people. Like, imagine if you could infect people who were allergic to bee stings just by being near them after getting stung yourself. Like, imagine if that happened. <laughs> but it doesn't happen, because that's not how anything works. Like, my idea for this series, if you were to ask me to tweak some details to make it better, would be instead of everything with the bees, just make it so that humanity's uh, released a vi virus that was supposed to wipe out the mosquitoes. And it did wipe out the mosquitoes, but then it went to bees, and then the bees started stinging people, and that's what turned them into beasts. Like, it would still be really dumb, anything involving zombies is when you stop and think about it, but it would be less dumb. So, just let's start off by saying that Beast is a lame name to begin with. Like, I know writers really hate using the Z word, but you need to give us something with a little bit of pizzazz, you know? Like, if you don't want to call them zombies, call them something like walkers, biters, infected, dissidents, revenants, phoners, rotters. Like, those are all terms I've seen used. If you wanted to stick with the honeybee theme, you could have just called them drones, you know? Like, just... That, that's a name. It's not a great name, but it is a name. Now, we don't see the beasts in these books very often. Other people are much more of a threat throughout the entire series. Now, it's not inherently bad, but I did find it disappointing. Kind of the same problem I had with The Last of Us TV show, but at least that show had the excuse that they had budget limitations. And we did at least get a few big moments that showed how dangerous and terrifying the infected really were. For example, we had the chase scene in episode 1 where Joel is carrying his daughter and trying to get away from that infected guy. Or later on in the show, we had that giant attack from underground, like where the sinkhole opened up and a bunch of infected came out and started ganking people. Like, those are both great scenes. There's enough here for us to see why humanity lost and why people avoid the infected and why they're terrified of them. And we just, like, it shows us why the world is this way. Even though the show isn't filled with moments like that, it gives us enough to understand what's going on. And the beasts in Stung don't have anything like that. Like, it's weird that humanity would fall to these guys because they just don't seem like that much of a threat. And what's even worse is that there's little to the beasts in Stung to set them apart or, like I said, to make them seem threatening. Like, it, it just doesn't seem like civilization would fall to these guys. Now granted, flu and famine would contribute to the fall of civilization, but it's mostly the beasts. But think about it, the beasts can't reproduce, since it's not bites or anything else that spreads it, it's just the vaccines they got, and so that means that once they realize it's dangerous, they'll stop, and that means that caps the number of beasts, and the number will only go down from there. They're also still alive, meaning they can die from exposure or starvation, and you don't have to get them in the head to kill them. That makes them a little easier to kill than regular zombies. And they're strong and fast, but people also keep them as guard dogs or pets or fighters. Like, we see raiders do that more than once. And when Jonah is still a beast and they have him in the fighting pit, he actually bends steel bars of his cell. Like, he's that strong, but they were able to catch him somehow. And at the same time, the beasts aren't smart, so there's no cunning traps, they don't lay plans or anything. They just aren't that big of a threat unless the characters are in very specific situations, e.g. if they're alone and have no weapons. But even then, Fiona 
can fight them by herself, barehanded, and survive for a little bit. Because remember, the fighting pit at the end of book one, she, she was by herself, she was barehanded, and she was able to fight them off and survive for a little while. They would have gotten her after a, a bit, but she was able to survive for a little while, even though she, again, does not have any special training or experience with this. So the beasts just don't feel like any sort of threat, and they don't have that much originality to them either. That said, zombie stories can do neat stuff with the concept, like they rarely do do neat stuff with the concept of zombies, but they can, and this series doesn't, because th the not zombies here, the beasts, are almost cool. Like they almost approach being cool once or twice, because they still have their minds, sort of, and really they're just in a state of psychosis. You know, it makes them like wild animals as opposed to, you know, living dead. And Fiona actually has a flashback to Before the World Ended. Uh, she has a conversation with her mom, and this is after the vaccine started affecting her, and she asks where her dad is. And her mom gets upset, and it turns out her brother actually killed their dad in a rage a month ago, and she has completely forgotten about it. And then she spent four years be being completely out of her mind before being cured, but that never really goes anywhere. You know, we see Fiona and Jonah dealing with the aftermath of spending years as a zombie, but it never really dives into the psychological effects of that, which is kind of what that movie Warm Bodies was about. You know, it's like rediscovering yourself after being dead for a long period of time. Like, it, it would have been kind of neat if we got something like that with Fiona and or Jonah, but we don't, because Jonah is just really quiet after being cured. Like, he, he's clearly changed and traumatized, but he's just really quiet. We don't see much else beyond that. And Fiona is exactly as she was before. It didn't affect her at all. It actually feels like this series didn't want to be a zombie story at all. Like, the beasts are barely there, they aren't a big deal when they show up, and nothing new or original is done with them at all. And that's disappointing to me, because sure, zombies are overdone, but they can be interesting. You know, they can be a mindless, faceless threat that the heroes have to face, or they can be a way to establish a central theme. Like in The Last of Us, to bring that up again, it's that love will make people do horrible things. Like at the end of the first season of the show slash the first game, Joel lets the world die to save Ellie. In 28 Days Later, the central theme is that with or without civilization, the biggest threat on Earth are groups of entitled men who are willing to use violence to force you to give them what they want. In Army of the Dead, the message is that we shouldn't let Zack Snyder write movie scripts. What sort of themes are there in Stung? Well, none. There's nothing. Not even as simple as, er, simple and romance focused as love conquers all or love makes you a better person. That's why, in spite of a lot of stuff happening in these books, they feel pretty empty. You know, and I feel like with a few basic tweaks, you could have made this story really be about how in dark times people lose themselves, but they're never beyond redemption. You know, because the cure to being a beast can only be administered if your loved ones are willing to try and help you. Like that, you could do something with that, but these books are just really not interested. I will give Stung one thing though. This could have very easily been the generic, oh, one person is immune to the zombieism and we need to make a cure, but it's not what it's about. You know, like it, the cure is already there when the story begins. Fiona is just the one who happened to get it and avoid being killed by Governor Jacoby Sonishin. You know, she's actually not that special. So that's one thing. What's happening? For when the bride arrived, and as I say, by this stage, the wind was fierce. My dad. All right, why is honey their main currency? Like, I know I briefly mentioned this, but that is their main way of exchanging goods and services, is honey. Like, food, sure, that makes sense for bartering. But why this one specific food? What is it about honey that makes it so special? Like, I know that the bees are gone, so they can't make more. It would be sort of valuable, but it wouldn't make sense as the main currency people use. People would just use, you know, food in general or bullets or other valuables to trade with. There's a flashback where Fiona's mom says, without bees, honey would become the rarest and most valuable food on earth. And would it, w would it really? Because you don't need to eat honey. I haven't eaten it in years myself. And a lot of people never have. Now, like, if I was starving, sure, like, I, 
I would take it, but I would take just about anything in that case. Like, if we're going for a specific type of food that everybody would agree to use as currency, potatoes would make more sense. You know, they're hardy, they grow pretty much anywhere, they're full of nutrients. I don't know, the honey as currency thing is just weird. It's also weird that the raiders here are just exclusively going after women. Like, it's pretty brief, and I, I know I only mention it briefly, but like at the end of the second book, their whole evil plan is to attack the walled, the walled city where civilization still exists and kill all the men. Like, they, they don't want to take the city and rule over it. Like, they don't want to have the walls as protection from beasts. They don't want to steal the food supplies or the weapons or anything. They just want the women. Now, I'm not saying it's unrealistic that people in this situation would want to take women as sex slaves. You know, again, 28 days later, that's a thing. And I'm sure they would do that when convenient, but that wouldn't be their sole purpose. That wouldn't be the main thing they do. I'm gonna let some of y'all in on a secret. Sometimes men have sex with each other, consensually or otherwise. Now these raiders are all forced together into a very violent environment where they can't escape and there are no women around, which sounds an awful lot like prison to me. I want you to hold this for me. Here, hold this. This Kool-Aid, we put this on bitches like you. Lick your lips. Just saying, like, these guys would be having sex with each other. <laughs> like, their activities wouldn't all revolve around women. You know, they'd be more concerned with, like, trying to get enough to eat and stuff. While Fiona is wandering around, she sees a newspaper with the headline, which is <clears throat> the White House spokesperson saying, We can't help you, you're on your own, which is stupid. Like, the government is always going to try and maintain order and convince people that you'll be safe if you do what we tell you, because without that, the government loses legitimacy and it falls apart. Like, either that news headline writer was doing some heavy edi editorializing, or the White House did a really bad job choosing a spokesperson. <laughs> Bowen specifically mentions in book one that there are seven men left in the world for every one woman. Why? How? No fucking idea. No, <laughs> no idea. It doesn't make any sense. Like, were women more affected by the bee flu? Not sure. And that, that's about it, about it. That's like the last big thing I have to say about the world here. But I will say one thing. The author tried to make a good setting. You know, she, she failed, but she tried. There was some creativity here. It just went in a bad, stupid direction. You can slip and fall on the banana peel. You can get in a car wreck. You can fall off a bridge. You can have an aneurysm on a toilet. You never know. What is stung? You know, how would I summarize this book series to people? Like, part of me wants to say, oh, it's about a world where bee stings turn people into zombies, but that's not accurate. And it's not really a dystopia, since the actual dystopia is the walled city most people live in, and the rest is just a wasteland. That's where the vast, vast majority of the story takes place. But granted, the, the line between dystopia and post-apocalypse is blurry. I guess if I had to assign a genre to this, I would say post-apocalyptic romance, but that's a very specific genre. Now, the plot of these books follows some people getting a cure out to the world, but that's the events of the series. Like, the actual story is, like, what it's about, you know? What journey are these characters going on? How are they learning and changing? How is the audience learning and changing along with them? What are we, the readers, learning? And I can't think of anything. Like, Stung isn't really about anything. It has a plot, it has things that happen, but it's not really about anything. But I did get a few laughs out of it, so I, I guess that's something. And I don't have anything big to end this on. So that's about it. Goodbye. Hello to everyone who watched this far. Not sure why you did that, but you know, thanks. Appreciate it. You're cool. Uh, all these names you see here, those are my patrons. Special thanks to my $10 and up patrons who are Arthur D. Gonzalez Martin, Brother Santodes, Carolina Clay, Dan Anselievich, Ich bin Langweilig, Jalal Delul, Kiana Arms, Lexi Delorme, Liza Rudakova, Lord Tiebreaker, Michael and Katie Hake, Proscriptions of Juo Jang, Rovi, Psych XS, Tesla Shark, Toa Michael, Vevictus, Wesley, and Zenitech89. You're cool. I like you. Without you guys, I couldn't do this. If you want access to exclusive content as well as early access to my videos, and you want your name here, then consider donating over on Patreon or becoming a YouTube channel member. You know, that works too. I don't have anything else to say here. I don't know why you're still watching. Goodbye.